In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe the Bible is a revelation of his way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. Greetings to you, my friend. Welcome to our Bible study, In Search of the Lord's Way. Yes, we do believe the Lord's way to live together is the best that's ever been introduced to the family of man. If you haven't tried it, please do that, will you? We're glad you've joined us for the study today, and it's our earnest prayer that we'll both be blessed. A few days ago, something was forwarded to my email box that I thought was quite refreshing, and I want to share it with you. It was the story of a small boy who came home from his Sunday school, stormed into the house, and shouted at his mother, I'm never going back to that church again. Well, his mother was shocked, and she'd never heard anything but positive comments about the child's Sunday school teacher, and, and she just couldn't imagine what might have happened. And the boy explained, my Sunday school teacher doesn't even know anything about God. She doesn't even know what God looks like. Oh, Mom was relieved, and she thought, uh, and she asked the boy, well, how's your teacher supposed to know what God looks like? And without a moment's hesitation, the boy bounced back. I drew her a picture of God, and she didn't even know what it was. Well, that may be a little amusing, but children are so honest and they're so innocent. But what does God look like? What's your image of God? Say, are we worshiping the same God? I wonder. We may not be, you know. Are we worshiping the God of the Bible, or does that really matter? Let's see in today's study. If you'd like an audio, a free audio cassette tape or a printed transcript of the program, What Does God Look Like? You may write us in Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma 73083. Or by email, our address is searchtv at aol.com. If you prefer to call us, you may use our toll-free telephone number. It's 1-800-321. 8633. Use that number and we'll pay for the call and send you the material you request absolutely free. Ken Helfbrand leads our singing. He's an excellent song director and we love him. And after the hymn, I'll be back for Bible reading and prayer. Today we're reading from the 115th Psalm. We're going to begin at verse 1 and read through verse 8. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He has done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the works of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. And they that make them are likened to them. So is everyone that trusts in them. That's the reading through verse 8. Now let's go to God in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, thou who art the God above all the gods of men's minds and making, 
We praise you and thank you today for your glory and for your majesty and for your being. As we study and search to know, more, know you better and know more about you, we pray that our hearts may be open to precious truths that you have revealed to us in so many ways. And we study in this message, we pray thee through the name of Jesus Christ, thy Son and our Savior. Amen. Little children can ask some questions that the wisest adults sometimes have to admit having difficulty answering to the child's satisfaction. Mommy, where did I come from? Daddy, where did God come from? Well, as you may have heard me say before, I grew up on a farm before the days of air conditioning. And I can remember just as a small child lying out in the yard on a summer night, gazing up into the skies above and wondering where did all the stars come from? I can never remember doubting that God made everything, even the stars, but from what did God make them? And where did God come from? How can God hear me pray and hear someone on the opposite side of the world pray at the same time? Why did God make us the way we are? Well, if you don't remember having asked yourself those questions, Perhaps you've heard your children or your grandchildren ask them. They're certainly relevant questions for both children and adults. In his publication titled, Does God Exist? John Clayton, former science teacher and atheist turned Christian, once wrote of the incredible human tendency to create and reshape everything that we have anything to do with in our own likeness. And as an example of that, he called attention to the children's storybooks and cartoons that humanize everything from mice and pigs to elephants and dinosaurs. I don't recall that he mentioned any by name, but at the very reference to it, you probably are thinking of Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, Kermit the Frog, Miss Piggy. Well, certainly the children can think of many more animals and birds and fish who talk and express human emotions and engage in human social activities, who live by human moral codes and are even involved in our institutions, such as schools and hospitals and churches. Well, they're in the comic strips and in the daily newspapers and in the TV advertising, too. We do the same with our pets. We're sometimes surprised and sometimes disgusted with the family dog or the cat that refuses to eat the foods that we think are best for him. We impose on them our own code of morals and ethics. If the dog insists on scratching when there are guests in the house, we punish him by putting him outside in the cold. Naughty dog. By whose standards is he naughty? Those who have studied such things say that animals have no fear of death. Still, I don't know about that. I'm still hesitant about accepting that even yet. But there I go again, you see, imposing my emotions on the animals. We do with inanimate things, too. We do the same thing. I knew a man several years ago who became so angry with his car one morning because it wouldn't start that he kicked it, and he called it a name we sometimes hear ascribed to humans, which I can't say on television. I don't remember that the car yiped back or limped away, but... <laughs> The man broke his foot and wore a cast for several weeks. Well, we try to do the same thing with God. There's no doubt about it. There are many men and women today who are living with an inner dissatisfaction and without faith 
simply because they haven't found or been able to create in their own image a God big enough in their estimate to account for life as they perceive it. Dr. Donald W. McCullough said in his book that is published a few years ago, he titled The Tribulation of God, he said, we've bred in our bones a thoroughgoing individualism, which accounts for our plurality of gods, if I might say. But Dr. McCullough continued with the thought, we will be tempted, therefore, he said, to create for ourselves gods who will not threaten us with transcendence. Gods who will be manifestly useful in a world of confusing voices and gods who will conform to the contours of our individualistic desires. The folly of making a god to fit the contours of our individualistic desires and serving him is that uh, such a God will always be a God totally incapable of doing for the man any more than the man can do for himself. The scripture says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? And Job says, is not a, God is not a man uh, that I am, that I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment, Job 9, 32. Well, some people picture God as being an old man living in heaven. He's to be respected all right and all of that, but, but he's totally out of touch with the real world and life in it. Others picture God as an over-exacting tyrant, an overzealous policeman, perhaps, who persistently pursues the sinner with, uh, to gleefully punish him for the slightest misdemeanor. And that's the picture of him which they reject to the, project into the community. On the other hand, many others think God is a comfortable, accommodating voice within who would never interrupt or interfere with our pleasures. Oh, no. Some people's God is all about material prosperity, money, success. With others, he's a miracle. When you think of God, always expect a miracle. Demand a miracle because it's your right. God is always with them. And finally, a power. Well, Dr. McCullough says again, any God who promises deliverance from all suffering and fulfillment of all desires is a quack whose therapies only worsen the disease. And he's right about that. So you see, David's description of the pagan's idol isn't that far out. I mean, the one that we read in the 50, uh, 115th Psalm a while ago. If we were to sit down and to carve our image of God out of a piece of wood or stone, or as if in the story with a small boy we told to introduce this message, we were to draw a picture of God, what do you suppose he'd look like? Would he have a nose and eyes and ears and hands and feet like we do? None of which really function except in, in the way that we like. Well, there's a word for that, of course, and it's a big word, and it's the practice of ascribing human characteristics to deity. Our God must be the kind of God we like, you know, or <laughs> he can't be our God. Our God has to say what we want him to say or he can't be our God. He must approve the things we approve or he just can't be our God. He must do what we expect God to do and, and, and if he doesn't, well, we'll put him outside with the dog whose behavior didn't measure up to our human expectations and behavioral standards either. But such a conception of God never, never inspires reverence and awe. Well, what is God really like? And how can we know what he's like? While the finite mind can never fully comprehend the infinite, God has revealed himself so that with only a little effort on our part, we can know him. Simply because we can't drink the fountain dry doesn't mean that we shouldn't drink enough to satisfy our thirst. God has revealed himself in three ways. First of all, he's revealed himself in the natural world. Whether you're familiar with the Bible or not, you've certainly and undoubtedly heard the oft-quoted statement found in Psalm, the 19th chapter, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. The heavens and the earth are abound 
just, they just abound in, in indisputable evidences of intelligence and power. With the aid of modern rockets and cameras and telescopes, modern man has been able to explore and photograph and study more of the starry skies above than any generation ever has. And we've discovered and harnessed the power of the atom and fathomed the mysteries of the seas. Consequently, we're experiencing a knowledge explosion of the vast universe in which we live. And the more we learn about it, the more confirmation we have of the first statement in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It's still the best. Well, it's still the only satisfactory answer which, uh, to the question of the origin of things. And the more we know about the world around us, the more glory we give to God. God and God's creation are inseparably linked. The Bible clearly says in Romans 1, 18, 20, that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it to them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even the eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse who disbelieve the things that may be known of God and are exhibited right among us in our visible creation. Secondly, the personal qualities of God are revealed in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. Again, the Bible says in John 1.18, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him or revealed Him, has made Him fully known. Jesus didn't cease to be deity when He came to the earth, but He took on Him the additional experience of human nature. He was both God and man, perfect God and perfect man, an absolutely unique being. And I want to take the time here to emphasize once more that despite the claims of some modern television evangelists to being God in the flesh, Jesus Christ is the only such person who has ever lived on this earth. And among other things, that was a purpose for his in, uh, incarnation. In the closing paragraph of the 13th chapter of John, Jesus told his apostles of his imminent death and departure from among them to return to the Father in heaven. Well, of course, they were saddened by that. They'd been with Jesus two and a half years, studied with Him, visited with Him. They'd come to love Him. He's going to be gone. But Jesus comforted them with the opening sentence of the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, saying, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you to Myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He promised him that he's going away and that they were to follow. Well, Thomas, who is sometimes called the doubter, said, Lord, we don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? This gave Jesus the opportunity to open up some spiritual truths for him as well as for us. And he says that he is the way to the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Furthermore, if you had known me, he says, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, you know him and has seen Him. No one has seen God, the Father, at any time. But he that has seen the Son has seen the Father and should know Him, not in the sense that, he's son, that the Son sometimes looks like His Father and reflects the character of His Father in His own behavior, but more than that, Jesus Christ came to this world to show us the Father. Thirdly, God has revealed Himself in the Scriptures. Just as there are some things that we can know about God and we can learn about His nature uh, uh, from Christ, which we learn only in the person of Christ, there are some things we can't know about Him except in His Word. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and so on. Inspiration in that passage simply means God breathed. So the Scriptures are the Word of God in the truest meaning of these words. He spoke them. They are His words. It's impossible to know God apart from His Word. 
No one has ever been known to come to God without having read or heard the Bible taught. The most comprehensive statement or message about God found anywhere is in the Bible in Acts chapter 17, verses 22 to 31. It is Paul's sermon to the men of Athens, and in it we learn one. God made the world. He made everything in the world. He is the ruler or the Lord of heaven and earth. He is spirit and is not confined to the limits of a physical body or space or time or in temples made with human hands. Neither is he fed or nourished by the things of men's hands as though he needed such things to exist. He is the source of life and the breath of all things. He is not a tribal or national God, but the God of all nations, tribes and tongues, and has made us all of one blood. He establishes kingdoms and raises up men to rule over them. He has predetermined the times of the, and the boundaries of their rule. And it is his will and purpose in, in world history that all men seek him and know him. He is a personal God, not far from every one of us, and to know our needs and our prayers. It is in him that we live and move and have our being, our very identity, his offspring. He is not a God of gold, silver, or stone graven by the art and craft of men in such ignorance he, God is overlooked, but he now commands all men everywhere to repent because, last of all, he will judge the world by Jesus Christ, whom he has raised from the dead. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us. We pray that our eyes are open now to a better understanding of you. May we live close to you and seek you in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. From the natural world, from the person of Jesus, and from God's revelation in His Word, we can seek Him and we can know Him and we can live with Him daily. It's the best life there is here and the only hope we have 
of life hereafter. I strongly encourage you to repent and to turn to God in obedience to His will and do it hastily today. I pray you'll become attached to Christ Jesus at once as you're baptized into Him as in Galatians 3.27. And it'd be a joy beyond expression to hear from you that you did so this very day. It'd be impossible in one program like this one to mention, to say nothing of discussing, all of the attributes of our God. But from the Bible, we can know that He is the Creator. He's not a mere imagination, inspiration, or a feeling, or an experience. He's not a casual friend with whom you can joke or joke about. He's not a, simply a, a marvel, a mystery, or a miracle. He's all-powerful, all-wise, and all-knowing, all-loving, and everywhere present. He's glorious, gracious, merciful, loving, long-suffering, and just. He's eternal, jealous, compassionate, righteous, unsearchable. He's invisible, he's good, upright, unchangeable, and true. He's perfect, incorruptible, and immortal. He is a consuming fire, and there's none like him beside him or before him. He is good and holy and faithful and incomprehensible. He's our creator, he's our father, our savior, and our judge. And if you're not living with him daily, and you'd like to know more about him, we'll be happy to send someone by to study the Bible with you. Please let us hear from you if that's your will and desire. Our program is presented free of all solicitations for money by friends of yours in Churches of Christ because we sincerely love you. This is a ministry for us, not a profit-making enterprise. And if you'd like a free audio cassette tape or a printed copy of this program, you may have it by writing us In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma 73083, or by calling us. Our email address is searchtv at aol.com. We have a toll-free telephone number for your convenience, too. It's 1-800-321-8633. And we're not going to bill you or put your name on a list to solicit you later by mail, but we would dearly love to have you worship with us in a nearby congregation. I sincerely hope you will. And if you need assistance in locating the congregation near you, or if you'd like more information about us, please let us hear from you. Visit our webpage too, will you? We plan to be back next week. Hope you will too. God bless you. We love you.